Uh, welcome to my talk. I'm, I'm, I am quite uh, um, surprised how many people are here. It's great to see. Thanks for coming. Um, my talk is called A Team in 10 Minutes. And to start that talk off, I'd like you to imagine, if you will, a scenario that hopefully is uh, in some way, shape, or form quite familiar to you all. Um, imagine it's a Thursday afternoon, maybe a Friday morning, don't mind, towards the end of the week. The weather forecast is excellent. You have some planned uh, weekend activities, maybe some time with the kids, some time with the family, barbecue, maybe a bit of football, it's that sort of season. Um, whatever works for you. In the office, for a change, your work in progress seems to be under control. The team's behaving itself. Your um, velocity, burn down, cycle time, metric of your choice looks stable, predictable, um, shortening, what, whatever. Everything is good with the world. And then, boom. Now, I don't know how this happens in your organization. Um, maybe it's uh, a Twitter storm about the um, uselessness of your latest UX, or maybe it's your Jenkins dashboards going bright red and screaming at you. Maybe it's a uh, critical priority JIRA ticket being raised by your key customer just before a payment milestone, um, whatever. But somehow, despite all the good stuff that a lot of the rest of this, con uh, this um, conference will be talking about, quite rightly, how to stop these crises happening, how to make uh, what we produce more predictable and higher quality. But somewhere along the line, one of these long tail events, the real crisis, is going to hit you. Does that sound vaguely familiar? A few nods and things, that's good. So. We've had the report that something's gone catastrophically wrong. How do we typically respond in our organizations? Usually, in my experience anyway, there's a whole load of phone calls and emails and text messages get sent out. Um, and you contact as many people as you can who might be useful. Some of them are contactable, some of them aren't. But you get as many of those people as you can um, together, either physically or virtually. Zoom conferences or whatever. If it's physical, you get them in that room, and I know the room, it's the room that's been booked uh, solidly, back-to-back -back meetings for weeks. It's the one that you've wanted to get your planning meeting in or your retrospective in, but you can't get it. But whenever you walk past it, there's nobody in there. Yeah, that's the room. And now it's free because these crises are sufficiently important for context switches to be uh, to be a viable and significantly necessary answer. So the team assembles, the tiger team, the crisis team, whatever you call it. The team is briefed, usually along the lines of, we really need this fixed by the time we go home. The consequences of this are company damaging, payment missing, job um, limiting, the team is briefed, the door is closed, pizzas are generally ordered at this point, and the people in that team look at each other and they genuinely hope, maybe it's hard to introduce themselves to each other, um, they genuinely, some of them will know each other, some of them may not, and they genuinely look at each other and they hope that their team performance can be good enough, quickly enough, to come up with a good outcome. But I've been a bit rude, really, I guess. Um, I should have introduced myself, for which I apologize. My name's Steve. Um, I'm a child of the 60s. I have three pretty grown-up kids now. Um, and I've been in the software engineering industry for, for the whole of my career, mainly in corporates. Um, I was first introduced to agile thinking and cultures back in the 90s. Uh, got involved in an XP project. Absolutely loved it. And spent many years then trying my hardest to practice agile thinking and stuff, but mainly um, in a guerrilla sort of style. It wasn't very mainstream. 
the organisations I was working with were not particularly receptive to these crazy new ideas. But slowly, to become more and more mainstream, slowly, words like lean and agile made it into my job title. Um, and most recently, I'm the uh, um, um, founder, proud founder, of a company that I'm calling Expanding Box. I'm not allowed to plug it, so see me afterwards for the um, for the discount that I can offer you if you need any individual independent coaching. Outside of work, uh, for all of this century, I've been a, an all-weather lifeboat navigator. So, uh, could I have a, just a quick show of hands? Uh, who's heard of or knows anything about the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the RNLI? Wow, quite a few. That's excellent. So, as well as um, pretty cool toys, the RNLI, for those who don't know, is an organization that operates um, all-weather lifeboats and inshore lifeboats all the way around the, co the coast of the UK and Ireland. Um, and when our, when our Coast Guard typically gets alerted to an incident happening offshore, um, they will ask the RNLI for the use of one of their lifeboats. When that happens, um, and a lifeboat is chosen, all of the volunteers that are involved in crewing that lifeboat are paged. I carry a pager, I've left it at home. Um, and as many of the crew that can make it rush down to the lifeboat house within the confines of the driving rules and so on, uh, a crew for the boat is then picked from that list of volunteers. We have about 30. A crew is picked, they're briefed, they get on the boat, the boat is launched. And that process from alert to launch normally takes about 10 minutes, typically. And I was thinking to myself the other day that that process sounds to me at a high level to be very similar to the process that we have in the organization when the unpredicted but bound to happen in the end crisis occurs. At work, we have some sort of alert, and the lifeboat, our pages go off. We get in touch with all the people that might be able to help on the lifeboat. Everybody who's available gets to the boathouse. We choose a crew, we brief them, exactly the same on the lifeboat. We stuff them in the room, order some pizza, nearly the same on the lifeboat. But for me, there's a, there's a very significant difference. And for me, the outcomes, at least in terms of team performance, feels quite different. In the organization, I said it quite deliberately, um, in the organizations I've worked with, those crisis teams hope that they are going to perform well enough to get a good and desirable and fast outcome. Whereas, when I get on my boat, um, despite there being a reasonable number of combinations of crews, my confidence in the team performance of that crew is sky high, absolutely sky high. And I was sort of interested in that, and that's what the talk is generally about. But first, a little bit of maths. Um, I said earlier I've got a couple of uh, I've got three children, two of which have just finished GCSEs. Anybody got kids that's just done GCSEs? No. When I was putting these slides together, I was um, um, trying to coach my kids through getting through their GCSEs and doing their uh, and and the parent in me wanted to just tap them repeatedly on the forehead and say, "Go to your room and do more work." That sort of that sort of approach. The coach in me wanted to interact with them a little bit more um, sensibly than that. Um, but I found myself interacting them with them uh, in the form of GCSE questions. So um, while I was thinking about this, uh, this talk, and I was thinking, well, we've got 30 crews, and, 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 and why is it so complicated? I wonder how many combinations of, of, of crews are possible. This is just an aside, by the way. There's no, no real need to take any notes at this point. Um, so I thought, if we need one of, we've got three coxswains, we need one of those. We've got five mechanics, we need one of those. Um, and we need four of the crew. How many combinations do you think are possible? Any, any ideas? How many? 
600, I've got, I've got a starting bid of 600. 10,000, was that? Let, let, let's keep it simple for now. <laughs> now, okay. Um, you know what? I, apart, from, apart from having f quite a lot of fun with PowerPoint uh, um, formula editor, uh, which I've never used before and probably will never use again, I think that that maths is right. I think. Um, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether it's right or not. I don't think, because that number is so huge that even if it's a factor of 10 out, there's no way that we could, um, we could be confident in that team on the lifeboat because we've all been to sea together in that combination before. There's no way we could do that. Um, so there must be something else going on, I reckon. Does anybody, is anybody good at maths, by the way? Because if, if you are and that maths is glaringly, uh, glaringly horrendous, then, then please do let me know and I'll correct it for next time I do the talk. But it is a, it is a crazy number. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> I thought I'd give you a quick example of, of um, um, the sort of confidence I had. And, uh, and forgive me if I stray into... Uh, um, um, swinging the lantern, telling stories a bit. Uh, the, the, this was in 2006. There was not a lot going on in 2006 on May Day. Uh, so this particular incident hit a lot of the um, tabloids and, 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 and this photo appeared spread across some of the most reliable uh, newspapers that we know of, like the Mail and the Sun. Um, uh, two people on board uh, about a 45 foot, 50 foot yacht. Brand spanking new this yacht was, brand spanking new, first time out to sea. They managed to sail it straight into these cliffs. Um, cliffs are about 100 feet tall, there's, there's no way they were getting out of there. And we got um, asked to go and help them out. Now, you notice this isn't the same boat that, 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 that I showed you before. This is our inshore lifeboat. 2006, I was significantly younger then, and I was allowed to get on this little boat. I'm apparently too old now, although I do uh, think I could still beat them in a running race most of the time, people who are allowed on it. Um, anyway, we launched, and on that boat, we don't even choose the crew. The crew chooses itself. It's a fast response boat, the way we run our uh, our station anyway, and the first three people get dressed and go. Uh, and and um, on this occasion, I was in command of this boat, um, and we were probably about halfway to the incident before I before I'd even sort of consciously recognised who was on the boat with me. Um, but I still had a huge amount of confidence in what we were going to do. The job itself was described to us as uh, there's a boat in difficulties close to the rocks. That happens quite a lot, and it usually means we're going to end up towing a boat, because usually close to the rocks doesn't mean really close to the rocks. It usually means, you know, I don't know, a quarter of a mile or something. And we usually tow them off somewhere safe and then try and sort out what the problem is. As we came around the corner, it became reasonably obvious that in this case, close to the rocks meant close to the rocks. Um, there's a lot of debris in the water. The boat was upright when we got to it, but it wasn't by the time we left. Uh, the two people had managed to get onto the rocks. I don't know how they did that, actually, because it's like, um, uh, it's like uh, photographs when you're skiing or, or, or photographs when you're driving cars. The conditions always look a lot easier um, in the photos, right? It was actually quite lumpy. Uh, not crazy, but quite lumpy. They managed to get from the boat onto the rocks and they thought they were safe. The problem was that the boat was also going onto the rocks and it was going onto the same rocks that they were on. So it was a bit awkward. Managed to get one of them off. I'm rambling now. I'll carry on quicker. Managed to get one of them off, it's this guy in red. But the, uh, the other crew wouldn't move. They were pretty much riveted. Um, so I put one of the crew on. His job was going to be public relations, which is help you get on the boat next time we get close. Um, and then a helicopter turned up and winched those two guys out. And, and, it was a, and, a, a, and a good outcome was had by everybody except for the uh, bank balance of the owner of the yacht. Um, the team performance in my head, even though I didn't know who I was going to see with, the team performance was never particularly in doubt at that point. 
And I see that as a significant difference when the organisations put crisis teams together, at least the ones I've been involved in. And I was wondering if it's something about the environment in which the RNLI uh, and the organisations work. So I had a quick think about what sort of environments organisations provide. All the organisations I've ever worked with have provided some sort of vision, um, usually at regular intervals, the quarterly targets, the uh, corporate values, the, the mission statement, uh, that, that sort of stuff. Some of it works, some of it doesn't, but there's some sort of vision there. Companies all provide stuff. You've got somewhere to sit, you've got pencils and paper and compute and, and, and chairs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and there's usually plenty of support. Uh, you get time off, you get paid, you get HR to help you out when there's a crisis. Uh, um, you get um, a hierarchy of leadership to, to help you work, all of that sort of stuff. And of course at the bottom there, training. All the organisations I've worked with have some sort of training budget, and when we need new technologies, new skills, uh, we acquire those skills through training courses or through mentoring or, or, or whatever. Now, the RNLI does all that as well. The RNLI is a big training centre down in Poole. We go on courses. Um, um, we get uh, plenty of training, plenty of training. So what is it? What's different if the report of an incident and at a high level anyway, the response to an incident and the environment in which this is occurring are sort of fundamentally similar? And what is it that provides that difference in outcome in terms of team performance? So I've got to be thinking a little bit more about the training. And that led me to start thinking about the complexity of the way the training is embedded into the organisation. Now, so who is aware of the, um, the venerable Dave Snowden and his work with Kenevin? Okay. At the risk, probably significant risk, of alienating all those who know about it and confusing uh, the bejesus out of everybody who doesn't know about it, let's take a lot of the words off the screen. Um, The Kenevin model says that there are two major domains for things like situations, decision points, scenarios. Those two domains are represented on this visual by five quadrants, only four of which are labeled. I practiced that. <laughs> uh, and if you're going to tweet it, then please put a smiley face because it's deliberately gobbledygook. Um, two, Two major domains represented by five quadrants, only four of which are uh, uh, only four of which are labelled. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got complicated and obvious. This is the ordered side of the world. This is where effect follows cause. This is where we recognise situations and we can apply best practice and we can or good practice and we can say um, um, we know the answer to this particular situation. Um, on the left hand side, labelled complex and chaotic, but I'll concentrate on complex for now, this is where, this is the habitat of the complex adaptive system. This is the habitat um, of the systems that are made up of lots of richly interacting components and they interact with each other whether you want them to or not. If you look at them, they interact in a different way to if you didn't look at them. Um, if you push them in one direction, they might go in that direction, but they might push back. They're fundamentally unpredictable. Although often, when they get to where they're going, you might say, oh yeah, I knew that was going to happen. In hindsight, we might be able to understand them, but in foresight, we can't predict them. Now. The right-hand side of this model, the ordered side of this model, is where organisational training sits, I believe. Um, we need to adapt a new technology, let's say, or we want to try out a new technology. Uh, we read about it, we, 
we try the 30-day free version, we, we uh, read up on some forums and so on and so on. And we're, we're working down here, we're requiring some skills, we're, we're, we're working in the obvious domain. Uh, we realise that this technology is, is, is rich and is nuanced and is, uh, is more complicated than that. So we might employ experts and move up into complicated and have a training course. The focus is on transferring those skills and embedding them into an individual or maybe a small group of individuals. The focus is on acquiring those skills. And that's where organizational uh, training ends and it doesn't push itself across into the complex side of the diagram. The RNLI manages to push it into the complex side of the diagram and it does it um, through the use of scenario based exercising. Exercising as in like military exercise, not as in like burpees and push ups and stuff. Um, real life scenarios. The focus shifts from individuals and small groups of individuals uh, acquiring skills. The focus shifts onto how teams may or may not choose to use those skills whilst trying to problem solve a real world problem, a real world scenario. So it's the use of the skills and not acquiring the skills um, that is important at this point. Now, the way in which that happens uses a couple of tools uh, that we hear a lot about in organizations, one of which we hear a lot about in organizations, I apologize, one of which we organize, uh, we hear a lot about in organizations, but one of which I don't hear much about in organizations. Um, the slide says ro roles and rituals. Roles or roles and responsibilities, organizations talk about quite often. Uh, generally, I have to say, that it is usually in the um, in the new project kickoff, uh, post reorganisation, um, program launch type way. Very rarely, very rarely do I hear roles and responsibilities mentioned in regard to crisis response. Um, now, roles on the lifeboats are very tangible. We need to have a radar operator. We need to have somebody who can drive the damn thing, somebody who can um, 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 uh, be the radio operator. And as such, they are usually very explicitly handed out, very explicitly handed out at the start of an incident response or an exercise. I'll come on to that in just a second. There's something important to note and that is the cardinality of these roles. Um, the roles are handed out almost without fail on a one-to-one -one basis, right? One role, one person. Now, it doesn't matter that one person may be qualified and perfectly capable of taking on more than one of those roles. It doesn't particularly matter that somebody could take on a multitude of those roles. Um, what matters is that the team, or the individual and the team, is very clear of what they're doing right now. Uh, and that's um, at, at the start of an incident response, they're very explicitly handed out. While a situation or an exercise scenario evolves, Sometimes those roles need to change. Okay, maybe we take somebody um, off of the lifeboat and put it on a casualty boat. Right, so now we've lost our radio operator. Somebody else needs to switch into that role. Maybe he'll drop the previous role. Maybe he'll he'll add to the current role he's got. Um, and the use of rituals is one of the ways in which. We make it very clear and it helps the team to, uh, to communicate and understand that it's shifted position from where it was to a new, to a new status. 
Now, the use of ritual, rituals in this case, they're not the chopping heads off chickens, pentagrams on church floors type rituals. These are, these are rituals um, that are steeped in usefulness. They're, they're, they're done for a good reason, but have somehow taken on some sort of ritualistic uh, meaning as well. So picture the surgeon who, who goes through the scrubbing up bit and gets gloves and, and then emerges into the theatre. They always do that on telly, don't they? They always walk in like that. Um, or picture the lifeboat crew. The lifeboat bloke that comes in through the door, he's an accountant when he comes in, or he was a, he was a bricklayer a minute ago, or he's painting somebody's front door. Um, he goes through the rituals of being briefed, putting on some kit, uh, going through the startup procedures of the boats. These have all taken on ritualistic uh, meaning. And by the time the boat is launched, he's not an accountant anymore. He's a lifeboat man. He's a radio operator. He's a coxswain. I don't see much of that happening in organizations. I don't know what rituals might look like in your organizations, especially with regard to crisis response. The use of a particular whiteboard that gets ceremoniously wheeled out and put at the front of the, of the room. Maybe it's the opening of a particular Slack channel or, or, or something, I don't know. I've seen people at, uh, in organizations put different clothing on when they switch roles. You know, I've got my testing hat on. Um, more, more, um, more commonly, I've seen organisations that uh, put do not disturb hats on. Uh, sort of gets abused, and they just put the hat on when they come in the morning, tap away, take it off again. But don't underestimate the power of a ritual um, to help transfer uh, an organisation or a team or an individual from one status into another status. And as a quick a quick side story. The RNLI had a, had a ritual a few years back that had the power to transform entire communities in seconds. Wow. This must be a, a claim beyond the normal. Um, before pages uh, were invented, the crews were called to action by firing these rockets up in the air. Um, these things called maroons. Basically rocket propelled grenades. And, and, and that's a clue as to why the RNLI doesn't have this as a ritual anymore. Um, too, a, a few too many close calls. But they basically go a thousand feet up in the air, handheld. You know, I've seen them fired horizontally while people are still reading the instructions. <laughs> anyway, a thousand feet in the air, huge bang. We fire two of those, boom, boom. Rattle the windows of the whole town. And the whole town certainly the people who live there, who understand the significance of the booms, um, um, were transformed. They would, they would drive down the road and, and look for people running. They wouldn't get out of the houses and run to their cars and drive down there. If they happened to be driving down the road, uh, they would pick people up that, that were running towards the lifeboat house. Uh, they'd look in their rearview mirrors and check that there wasn't somebody trying to get past them. They'd come out of their houses and watch the lifeboat launch and then put 50p in the bucket, that sort of stuff. Uh, don't underestimate the power of those rituals. So what are we doing in the lifeboats when we do these scenario-based exercises? Well, it's really very simple. We're just team building. Okay? We're just team building. And every time we do one of these scenario-based exercises, we're, we're team building with one, maybe a few, of those 190,000 combinations. The secret is, though, that we're doing it before we need the team. We're doing it in anticipation of something needing the team. We're doing it in anticipation of the event that would make us put that team together for real in an incident response. Now, I don't see, well, let me talk a little bit first about what these scenario-based exercises sort of look like. Um, we're preparing for the time when we need the team for real, and we do it in a reasonably predicted format, pres prescriptive format. Uh, first of all, we will explain the scenario, 
and we'll, it's very important that we explain it in real life terms. We don't say, for example, tonight we're going to go out, out to sea and we're going to perform a, a search pattern. That's, that's a skill. That's over in the ordered side um, of that Kinefin model. Um, what we will say instead is we'll invent something. For exercise purposes, two kayakers are overdue. They were last seen at position XY three hours ago. Uh, our mission is to uh, locate them and assist them if they need to, if they need assisting. By explaining it in real life terms, you get more of a real life response and it brings those team dynamics into play uh, and you may or may not use the skills that the scenario thinker has in mind when he comes up with that scenario. So the scenario is played out in real, uh, in real life terms um, and it's briefed in real life terms. We use a format for briefing the crew. Uh, I went through a bit of it then. There's a situation, there's a mission, how we're going to execute it. Any administration, that's where the roles are allocated out. Um, and any communication sort of nuances that are there. We might have, we might be going out to see a, uh, um, to, to look at a boat that's sinking. They may be in contact with the, uh, with the Coast Guards already. That, by the way, is, is a, um, stolen from the military. It's called a five paragraph briefing, I think, or SMEAC briefing. Um, it's quite handy, I find, in, in, in organizations anywhere, anywhere where you want to kick something off and, and, and explain. It's like, the, it's like an introduction for a workshop. It would work quite well, um, um, those types of scenarios. Um, so the scenario is described in real life terms. We've briefed the crew. The team is picked for, to maximize the team learning. We're not gonna pick the team um, for exercising, for preparation. We're not gonna pick the team that is necessarily best uh, equipped in terms of skills or experience to, to um, solve the problem. We're going to pick it for maximum team learning. So we might pick a guy who hasn't worked as a navigator for a, a while or, um, or hasn't worked with that particular mechanic before or, or, or whatever. We're trying to smooth out some of those 190,000 com combinations by putting them together in novel, in novel ways. And then the important thing with these uh, scenario-based exercises, the important thing is that they are allowed to evolve to a natural conclusion within the um, enabling constraints that are set upon us. The enabling constraints will include a time limit, so it might just run out of time, I guess. But they're allowed to evolve in any way they like. Now, this is tricky for um, people like me, and I suspect some of you in the room too, because when I think up scenarios, I think of them in terms of a solution. And I think of them in terms of how I would respond. Um, and it's very difficult for me to watch a crew responding in the wrong way and for me to not butt in and say, you know, you're going down the wrong path here. So we let them evolve and then we debrief what we get at the end. Um, when they evolve in a very different way, to how we're expecting, that's where we learn. I may learn a load um, when I understand why the coxswain on the day chose not to run the search pattern I was thinking of, um, but to go in a completely different direction. I, I don't know, I haven't thought of an example. Um, but if you like, we allow those scenarios to fail in some way, um, and failing, that's the wrong word, um, but failing in this case is where we get the maximum learning from. In exercising as well, we allow, um, whereas we may not in real crisis response, we allow uh, new novel ideas that we've not as a team tried before, um, which is our version of encouraging emergent practice that might become standard practice um, over time. So what do we see in organizations? Do we see any preparation like the RNLI's real world scenario exercises going on? Because we know, right, that whilst we can mitigate a lot of the things that can go wrong, 
puts something on that long tail, you know, the black swan stuff, way out on the right, um, we know that something is going to go wrong. So what preparation do I see organizers, organizations making for this? Well, very, very little, actually. Um, Simon Wardley says this, and I tend to agree with him. Um, and there's another chap. If we're not preparing, then we're trusting to luck, right? We're putting teams together in response to crises and we're trusting to luck. Luck is for the unprepared. For the prepared, it's called an opportunity. So if we can prepare somehow, this is an opportunity for your organization to differentiate itself from the other organizations that are also at some point going to have a crisis event and need to respond to it. Now, I know this is sort of in a, in a risk management sort of way, perhaps, or, a, or a, um, making the best of a bad job type scenario, because we'd rather the crisis not happen. But if you look at the curve, the crisis is going to happen sometime. So why don't organizations prepare for it? I'd go so far as to say, actually, that organizations often actively avoid preparing for the unpredicted event by, um, um, by maximizing the uh, capacity usage of all the planned stuff that's got to go on. That's a terrible phrase. Um, by, by planning for maximal capacity and not building in um, um, any time to prepare, and not building in any time to respond, um, which is like a denial of the fact that anything feasible could happen um, and something feasible but unexpected will happen at some point. It's like the lottery bit, isn't it? We don't know which ticket is going to get pulled, um, but we can guarantee that one of them is. There's another, um, there's another quote as well that I, that I like, um, which I think is attributed to Gary Player, the golfer, the old golfer, but I'm not sure, not sure it really was him. He says, the harder I train, the luckier I get. Um, the more I prepare, uh, the more it looks simple. Um, I quite like that one too. Not that I train particularly hard. Uh, so, a real quick recap. Everybody, I imagine, is, is familiar with Tuckman cycle, uh, the forming, stormy, norming stuff. What we're trying to do, as much as we can, and using tools like explicit, explicit roles and rituals to help us transit from one role to another, um, that helps the team understand where it is. What we're trying to do is get through the forming, stormy, norming bit as much as we can with, with as many um, abstracted versions of that 190,000 teams as we can before we need the team. Before we need the team. The unpredicted event hasn't happened yet, but we're putting the teams together on a regular basis so that they will be better at it when, um, when we do need it. Well, why can't your organization do that as well? Well, I think you can. I think you should go back to your organizations and I think you should write two lists. I think you should write a list down of all the names of the people in the organization that could feasibly help you out when, uh, uh, when bad things happen. I nearly saw then, sorry. Bad, bad for the video. Okay, this list should be diverse, both geographically and skills base based. All the people that could feasibly help out. Now that might be uh, a guy from accounts, um, not just the technical people. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know your organizations. So you've got a big long list of people. The other list is a list of all the problems you've got in your organization, and I bet you have them, that are not important enough to apply people to right now, um, and they may never get to the top of the list but neither are they so trivial that they're going to go away. It's like technical debt, right? 
um, technical debt within the organization, organizational debt, if you like. This is beginning to sound like a solution, I think. We've got a list of real world problems. They're no longer scenarios like I was talking about with the RNLI. They're real world problems. They're real problems within your organization. And you've got a list of real people that you think might be useful when a crisis occurs. Well, why not get them practicing for when the crisis occurs by putting them together in some sort of crew putting some enabling constraints around them. Maybe that would be in terms of how much time they can spend, um, what they can and can't solve. I don't know, that sounds a bit governing to me. Um, how you would like them to report. Get them to form, get this big long list of people to form into teams. Now maybe, again, in, in your organizations, I don't know how that would work. Maybe you pick them and say, can you five work together? Maybe you um, get them to self-organize and coach them through that process. But now you've got some crews. Hopefully those crews are diverse and hopefully they haven't worked together before uh, because what we're trying to do here is, is um, like my 190,000 um, uh, possibilities for a lifeboat crew, we're trying to get some of those people together and build those rich networks. And you let them choose one more none of those real organizational problems you've got. Now, some of those teams will die. Some of those teams won't do anything. Some of those teams will start with one problem, it'll evolve into something else completely. Some of them will pick a problem, it's not the one that you have depicted. They might even fix it, who knows, but they'll focus on it. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all, because yesterday, nobody was looking at these problems. And what we're doing is not fixing those problems. What we're doing is building the crisis teams and practicing exercising for when the black swan event occurs. So what do you get out of it? I should say, before I forget, form as many of these crews as you possibly can and run as many of them in parallel as you possibly can um, um, for diversity, uh, and don't worry about them all looking at the same problem. You, you'll, you'll get different solutions. You'll get um, emergent solutions, different perspectives. Some of those teams, some of those teams will, all they will do is add to the list of problems that you've got. Um, they will just look at all the problems and go, yeah, as well as that, we've also got these organizational issues as well. Well, that's okay, they're forming. What are you likely to get? Well, so, like I said, forget the, um, um, forget the solutions to the problems. What you're definitely likely to get is a much richer network. You're connecting people. Those people will be connected to other people. Uh, those, those rich networks will provide resilience in your organization. This is before they've fixed anything. The people involved are likely to feel more connected to their work. They're likely to feel more engaged. It's a good word at the moment. You might even get some of those problems solved. I don't know. That's pretty much my message, is to go back to your organizations and, and, and try to implement some of these ideas. Um, in advance of the problems occurring for real. So practice for these crises by putting the crews together. Practice by allowing them to bend themselves to solve real problems that you've already got. And you'll get benefits even if the crisis never occurs. But you might just get some novel solutions to some real problems that you weren't looking at yesterday as well. Um, thank you very much for your time. I realize that I'm in between you and lunch. Uh, I'm quite happy to answer questions and I'm equally happy to uh, meet you all afterwards over a cup of coffee. Thank you.